So today we continue our series, our seven-part series, on stewardship. We've talked about uh, stewardship of our time, the stewardship of our talent, the stewardship of our temple, our bodies, as well as the stewardship of our treasure. We've said at the very beginning that stewardship is about our entire life, not just our pocketbook. And so today we continue this series in talking about the stewardship of our testimony. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we invite your Holy Spirit into this place. We thank you for being here with us. Open our hearts and minds, and Lord, speak to us from on high, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. A store manager heard his clerk tell a customer, No, ma'am, we haven't had any for a while, and it doesn't look like we'll be getting any soon. Horrified, the manager came running over to the customer and said, Of course we'll have some soon. We placed an order last week. Then the manager drew the clerk aside. Never, he snarled. Never, never, never say we're out of anything. Say we've got it on order and it's coming. Now, what was it she wanted? Rain, said the clerk. (laughs) This is a funny story about the power of our words. Finish this saying for me. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. A nursery rhyme that appeared back in 1862 in the Christian Recorder. The intent of this familiar rhyme was good. We should restrain ourselves from physical violence. Let taunts go without response. Don't be drawn into a physical altercation. However, nothing could be further from the truth. In reality, words hurt much worse than stones. The impact is much deeper and the scars take much longer to heal if they ever heal. A hasty, hurtful word said out of anger can never be unsaid. Words are an interesting thing. Words can build others up or tear them down. So today we're talking about our words. Not so much the words that we use each and every day, but we're talking about the stewardship of our testimony. So what is our testimony? It was late one Monday night. I'd been up in the mountains at my small church. I was on my way home after a board meeting. It was 10.30, 10.45 at night. I was ready to be home and be in bed. It had been a long day. A lot of work had gotten done, but I was exhausted. I was coming down the last straight stretch on the way home. Only about two or three miles left to go. And as I was driving down the straight stretch, I saw a set of headlights come around the corner. And as they came around the corner, they looked a little odd. And as I continued to watch, they veered off in front of me and end over end into a field. I never had called 911 before, but I quickly pulled out my phone and dialed 911. The operator said, what is your emergency? I said, there's just been an accident. I saw a car. It went end over end. It's out in a field. The lady said, would you be going willing to go check. And I said, I'm already on my way. I was over the barbed wire fence into the field, approaching the vehicle. And as I approached, I saw the steam from the radiator coming out. And of course, thinking Hollywood, I'm saying, this thing's going to blow. I approached the vehicle and looked inside and saw nothing. I told the operator, there's nobody here. (laughs) She said, would you be willing to look around? I got back to my car and I moved my headlights across the field so that I could try and see if there was anybody there. And I saw something close to the road. Angled my headlights right at it. I got out and I walked over and there on the ground lay a woman face down, you know, in this kind of a pose. And I thought, oh no. And as I stood there for just a moment, I saw her back rising and falling. Praise the Lord, she's not dead. But she was not responsive. She was out. I flagged down another car and the gentleman came over and was going to move the lady. I said, no, don't touch her. Go see if you can find anyone else. Not too long after this, the first responders showed up. They came and began to attend to this woman who I could not help. 
The first responding officer came over and said, are you the witness? I said, yes. He said, would you come with me? I went to the back of his cruiser and he handed me a form to fill out and I began to fill it out. My name, phone number, address, and the experience that I just had. I gave my testimony. We all have a testimony to share. You may not have witnessed an accident or a crime, but you are a witness. You have a testimony to share. As Christians, we have a testimony. We have an experience with Jesus. We have a reason to follow him, a reason to give our lives to him, a reason to be called Christians. We have a relationship, an experience with Jesus. We have something to share. So the question is, what is your testimony? I have to admit, for many years, this question really scared me. It bothered me a lot. Well, what is your testimony? You see, when I heard stories about testimonies, it was people who were going the wrong direction. Their life was going down the chute. It didn't look promising. And then something miraculous happened. Their lives were turned around and they were giving everything to God and they were powerful in His hands. And I looked at my life. I have a vanilla life. I grew up in the church. I went to church school. I went to Adventist higher education. I worked for the church. I've never had any amazing story happen in my life. I didn't, I didn't have a miraculous turnaround, and so it scared me. What kind of testimony do I have? Do I even have a testimony? Well, I've since figured out that indeed I do have a testimony. I do. God has been working in my life. He's led me to where I am today for a reason. He led me from pursuing a medical career to pastoral ministry. He gave me a passion for people and for the eternal well-being. He's been leading me every step of the way right here to Nampa. The question remains, what is your testimony? Open your Bibles with me this morning to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, Peter here is, is writing to a group of Christians, a group of Christians in Asia Minor. He's writing this letter to no one specifically, but just kind of as an open letter to all the Christians in this area. He's writing to the Christians in Asia Minor with a pastoral purpose in mind. He writes to elevate Christ before the people. He writes to encourage them to continue to put Christ first. 1 Peter chapter 3, and we're going to look at verse 15 this morning. Peter writes, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. First, Peter says, Sanctify the Lord God in in your hearts. Now, this isn't common vernacular. You don't go around using the word sanctify. And outside of a conversation about potentially the Sabbath, you wouldn't use it. Sanctify simply means to set apart, make special, treat differently, set this thing apart as holy. Peter here in this verse is actually quoting the prophet Isaiah. The prophet Isaiah says, actually the Lord says to Isaiah in Isaiah 8, 13, The Lord of hosts, him you shall hallow. Let him be your fear and let him be your dread. Now you say, wait a second, that doesn't sound good. <laughs> but what Isaiah or what God is telling Isaiah is that all of Israel is to respect God. They are to honor him, to give their allegiance to him, to make him number one. Now, why would Peter say this? I mean, shouldn't this be obvious? Kind of like our children's story. You wouldn't go and say, hey, look, I lit a candle when it's sitting there burning, right? You can kind of see that. It's obvious. Why would Peter tell Christians, make Jesus number one? It's kind of crazy. But he tells us 
uh, in 1 Peter 4, 3, for we have spent enough of our past lifetime in the doing the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lewdness and lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. Peter says, I know where you've come from. I know your history. I know your background. And I know it's easy to fall back into the old ways, the old patterns. So he reminds the people that they need to make Christ number one. They need to set him apart as their highest authority. And this message is so relevant for us today, isn't it? I mean, we have nothing in society that takes us bondage, do we? The technology we have makes us so much more efficient. We get so much more done. And we have so much to draw us away from him. I have a folder. I probably shouldn't admit this. But I have a folder in my phone. And it's called Time Wasting. I know it's a waste. And yet, I'll visit that folder from time to time. So many things to distract us from Jesus, Peter tells the Christians, set him apart as number one. Make him first in your life. Sanctify him. There are so many things today that contend for our time, so many things that we can push ourselves or that push themselves to the forefront of our thoughts and our energies. There are so many ways in which we can lose our focus on Jesus. So Peter says, sanctify the Lord God in your lives. Make him number one. Don't let anything else Get in the way. Paul says the same thing in in Romans chapter 13, verse 14. Rather, Paul says, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Paul hit the same thing. He said, come on, leave the old life behind. You've put on Christ. You're a new creature. Leave those things aside. We must make Christ number one and not forget to leave him there. The founder of McDonald's, Ray Kroc, was asked by a reporter what he believed in. I believe in God, my family, and McDonald's, he said. Then he added, when I get to the office, I reverse the order. How many of us do the very same thing? We know the right answer. We know what we're supposed to say. We even know the way it's supposed to go. We know how we should live our lives. And yet, when we get to the office, when we walk out the front door, what do we do with our priorities? Do we do a little flipperoo? Peter writes, 1 Peter 3.15, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Peter says, always be ready. I love this. I love this command of Peter. He says, well, just don't take it easy. You know, don't just say, oh, I see trouble coming. I'm going to get ready. He says, always be ready. Every moment. Nothing's going to get by you. You will be prepared. Always be ready, he says. There's no downtime, no time that we might get caught off guard. We should be prepared at every moment. And what should we be prepared for? Um, World War III? Stock market crash? Crazy teachings? That's what we're supposed to be ready for, right? Well, that's not what he says here. He says, always be ready to give a defense, to give an answer to anyone and everyone. Be prepared to give an answer. So we're always to be ready to give an answer. What's one plus one? You got it. You were prepared. Right? You were prepared. You were ready to give an answer. You didn't have to think about it. You didn't have to say, well, let me check. Uh, I'm not sure about that. You knew the answer right off the bat. You were prepared. And why? Because you've had experience with this question before. You know the answer so well, you could tell it in your sleep. And some of you may have. You have the experience. You have been prepared. The same should be true of our testimony. We know our testimony intimately because it's ours. It's our story. 
It's our testimony. The psalmist tells us in Psalm 119, he says, I will speak of your statutes before kings and will not be put to shame for I delight in your commands because I love them. He says, I am ready to share your testimony. I'm ready to share with whoever it may be. I won't be caught off guard. Think of a moment for your, think, think for a moment rather about your kids or your grandkids or your nieces or your nephews or your students. Think about those children that are in your life that are near and dear to you. You love them, you are proud of them, and you're more than happy to tell when they've accomplished something new. I was just looking through some, uh, some pictures last night of, uh, of our kids as we were trying to figure out how to tell our kids about the new little one. And as I was uh, going through the folders and looking at all the pictures, I happened to see a particular picture of little porta potty. <laughs> yeah, you know why too, don't you? I was so excited. You don't normally send those kind of pictures around, right? I mean, that's no. Uh, but for new parents, woohoo! It's exciting. You get excited about that kind of stuff. Uh, you get excited about a lot of other stuff too. <laughs> But we get excited about those things. We, we're so excited to tell because we're so proud. We're so thrilled about this new development, about this experience, about this relationship. And shouldn't be the same be true of Jesus? The one who created us, the one who died for us, the one who has given us the opportunity to have eternal life. <laughs> Peter says... 1 Peter 1 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his mercy, in his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. This is great news, friends. This is news worthy of being spread. How can we contain it? We should always, as Peter says, be ready to give an answer. But Peter continues. He says to be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks why we can keep going through difficult situations. Peter tells tells us that the world will ateo. They will ask. This Greek word isn't just, oh yeah, so why, why are you feeling good today? It's not just a nonchalant kind of thing. It implies that there's a feeling of urgency. It's almost a demand. Tell me, why can you get through this stuff? How do you do it? I need help. It's almost as though we're commanded to give a response for the hope that we have. Somebody's begging us to give them our testimony. Peter says, be ready. We are to prepare to give a response to those who may demand from us an answer. Jesus said to the disciples in Luke 12, he says, Now when they bring you to the synagogues and magistrates and authorities, do not worry about how or what you should answer or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Now I can hear you saying, well now preacher, wait a second. You said we need to prepare, but Jesus says we don't. What's going on here? Did you have to prepare for my little quiz for you, one plus one? Well, you did, just not right now. (laughs) You did the preparation before. You knew it like the back of your hand. Have your testimony ready so that you are prepared at any moment to give it. You could say it in your sleep. But don't be afraid when somebody asks you a hard question that you aren't prepared for. (laughs) Let the Holy Spirit work. Let him do his job and give you the words that you will need. The Seventh-day Adventist commentary says that church members must be prepared to meet the challenges of the world's keenest minds. Truth is reasonable and is never afraid of the facts. We should never be afraid to share with others the reason that we are able to share, or uh, the reason that we are able to face troubling times without fear. Notice our actions speak louder than our words. People see what's going on and they say, wait a second. Why are you so hopeful? Why can you go through this? They see our behavior and that causes them to say, why? It's the actions that bring us to the point of sharing with others. As Elaine shared this morning in our children's story, people will see the light and they'll say, wait a second, what's going on here? 
our response is to tell others why we can have the peace in the midst of the storm. Over the last month, I've had to do some really hard funerals. From an infant to a 10-year-old boy full of life. It's something I wish we never had to do, but in this life, in this life of sin, we have to face these tragedies. And if it were not for the hope that I have of the resurrection, of the second coming of Jesus, of the reuniting of families, I don't know how I could do it. I have a great hope, a hope of something better than this life has for me, a hope of a place where death will no longer be the, be the end result of life. I have a hope of a place where things are perfect. The hope of being in the presence of Jesus. And without this hope, life is meaningless. So Peter has written to the church in Asia Minor. He says, sanctify the Lord God. Make Christ first in your life. Don't let anything take that place away. He says, be ready to give an answer for the hope that you have at any moment. Be ready when they come demanding an answer. And finally, he responds and goes on to say that we are to give that response with meekness and fear, with gentleness and respect. Abraham Lincoln's secretary of war, Edward Stanton, was angered by an army officer who who accused him of favoritism. Stanton complained to Lincoln who suggested that Stanton write the officer a sharp letter. Stanton was happy to. And showed the strongly worded missive to the president. What are you going to do with it? Lincoln inquired. Surprised, Stanton replied, send it. Lincoln shook his head. You don't want to send that letter, he said. Put it in the stove. That's that's what I do when I write a letter when I'm angry. It's a good letter. And you had a good time writing it. And you feel better. Now burn it and write another one. You see, there are two ways to handle every situation. With anger and disgust, or with peace and understanding. We can say the exact same thing in two different ways and have two entirely different responses. As Christians, there are things in society that we definitely do not agree with. We can treat others with disrespect and anger. However, the response will not be surprising. Look at the response that's taken place to the actions of the Westboro Baptist Church. Maybe that rings a bell, maybe it doesn't. Members of this church have picketed funerals of servicemen who have fought in Afghanistan. They've stood by the road in street corners holding signs saying, God hates you, you're going to hell. They may be standing for biblical principles, but they are not treating others with gentleness and respect. They are disregarding the word of Peter. I believe these Christians are misrepresenting God. Yes, we are to call sin by its name. We cannot avoid that. We must call it by its name, but we are to do all that we do with gentleness and respect. Look at the life of Jesus for an example. He happened to be in the temple teaching one day and this woman was brought and thrown before her, for him. And the the church leader said, hey, this woman was caught in the act. Moses said, we stone her. What do you say? What did Jesus do? Lambaster in front of everybody? Yeah, stone her. Get rid of her. No. Jesus knelt down in the sand, began to ride out stuff and said, okay, whoever's without sin, you go ahead and throw the first rock. One by one they left. Then Jesus said, go and sin no more. What about that, uh, that short guy? What was his name? Um, yeah, Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus. Yeah, okay, we don't need to go that way. The tax collector. We all love tax collectors, right? <clears throat> so Zacchaeus was likely loved. Equally loved. And Jesus is walking down the street and, well, there's a little guy up in the tree. What's Jesus do? Hey, Zacchaeus, come on down. I'm going to go to your house for lunch today. What? What? A hated tax collector? Jesus is going to go with him? And then Jesus is walking down the street and out come these guys, unclean, unclean, and they come running towards Jesus. (laughs) Jesus could have said, hey, hey, no, 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 stop right there. 
Nope, nope. You brought this on yourself. Stay away. No. He says, no, it's okay. Go show yourself to the priest. You're healed. They take off. Jesus treated each one with love and respect. So Peter tells us that our response, our defense for the hope that we have, should be given not with angry tones and condescension. It should be done with the love for those who are turning their backs on Jesus. We should have a deep love and concern for those who have rejected God or who appear to have rejected God. And for those who are asking legitimate, difficult questions, we should answer them with as much love as we can humanly muster. Questions aren't necessarily a sign of doubt. Paul writes to Second Timothy and says, or writes to Timothy rather, <laughs> there's only one Timothy, Paul writes and says, those who oppose him, he must gently instruct in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. Why should our answer for the hope that we have be done with meekness, with gentleness, with respect for the eternal well-being of those that we are talking with? That's what it's about, saving souls, souls in the kingdom of heaven. We are to love even if we don't feel like it for their eternal well-being. Paul writes and tells the Colossians, Colossians 4, 6, let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so you may know how to answer everyone. The words we use are so critically important. So, we come back to the question, what is your testimony? We know that we are to be ready every moment to share with others for the reason or share the reason for the hope that we have with a gentle answer. But what does this look like? Well, I encourage you to do a couple simple things. First of all, think what your life was like before Jesus. What did you used to focus on? I don't care if it's a vanilla life or a very uh, rainbow sherbet life. What was your focus on? What was life like before Jesus? Then what brought you to that point? What brought you to the realization that you needed Jesus in your life? Was it a tragedy? Was it a triumph? Was it some little scripture scribbled graffiti on the wall downtown? What was it that brought you to that experience with Jesus, that need that developed in your heart? What brought you to that point? And finally, what is your life like now? Is it a bed of roses, no problems? Or can you be honest enough to say it's still a struggle? What was your life like then? When did you meet Jesus and what is your life like now, friends? This is your testimony. This is your story, your experience with Jesus, your relationship with him. Beautiful thing about it is you can't be wrong. It's your experience. It's what you have experienced with Jesus Christ. Our testimony should be something that is easy to remember and can be shared at any moment. Simply, what was life like? Why did you come to Jesus? And what is life like now? Friends, we are stewards of our testimony. We are responsible for the message that we tell to the world about Jesus. And I want to challenge you today. If you haven't thought about your testimony yet, if you haven't looked at these three questions, take some time this afternoon. Take some time this afternoon to think about these questions, to maybe put some things down on paper or etch it in the memory that you have. Put those things down, be prepared to share. And then this week, I want you to pray all week that God will give you the opportunity to share your testimony. Because you see, we can talk about it this morning. You say, oh yeah, that's great. And you can go home and not think about it in 15 years from now when you hear it spoken on again. You say, oh yeah, I was gonna do that. I probably, ought to, I probably ought to do that. Don't wait. Take the time today. I tell you, when you share your testimony, it's amazing to see how God blesses. The reward of sharing that, the experience of someone else saying, oh, really? You know, I've been going through some stuff just like that. How did you deal with? And you all of a sudden have an opportunity to minister. You know, we have an opportunity next Sabbath when we're gonna go hand out batteries to our community. <laughs> Be ready. 
Have your testimony ready because when somebody sees you come to the door and give them something with no strings attached, they're going to say, what are you doing? The world doesn't work that way. Yeah, I got a free gift, but I paid $4.95 for shipping. Nothing's free. Why are you doing this? Why can you do this with a bad economy? How can you go and give this kind of thing? Oh, I don't have smoke detectors. What, what am I supposed to do with it? <laughs> Be prepared to share your testimony. Maybe it won't happen. Maybe you just have some people that are surprised and that's it. Fine. But I encourage you to be ready because the Lord works in mysterious ways. Come meet our community and be prepared to share your testimony. Friends, you are a steward of all that God has given you and that includes your testimony. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for the many blessings you give to us. We thank you for the experience that we have had with you and we continue to have with you. Lord, I pray that you will help us to take Peter's words seriously that we will prepare our testimony, that you will use us this week to share that testimony with someone, to share with them your love and the difference you've made in our life. Lord, we ask that you go with us now. Bless us in this week. Keep us close to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.